Matthew chapter 25. We resume in our series on the parables of our Lord, and we are to the set of parables that speak of His coming. What we have tried to do is give an overview of the parables. The first two gave the overall picture of how it would begin, of what would happen, and how it would end. Then we noticed the use of God's grace. We've noticed also the matters of personal responsibility. And now we come to this particular parable that speaks of readiness for his return. Then the kingdom of heaven will be comparable to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out in the night to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were prudent. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. Now the prudent took oil in flasks along with their lamps. Now while the bridegroom was delaying, they began to sleep. But at midnight there was a shout, Behold, the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the prudent, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the prudent answered, No, for there would not be enough for us, and you as well. Go instead to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they were going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. Later the other virgins also came, saying, Lord, Lord, open up for us. For he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Be on the alert then, for you do not know the day nor the hour. Let me ask you, if you were at the Olympic trials and you were watching, getting ready to watch the 100-yard dash, and there was an athlete who was top, who was expected to win it all, but all of a sudden you saw him come up with hiking boots, and a backpack, and some kind of a walking stick. And he got down into the starting position. Is he ready to run the race or is he not? On the other hand, say that you were ready to watch a cross-country race in the snow, and all of a sudden there was a man with his track shoes, his track shorts, and his track shirt. Is he ready? So the question is, we may know in some way how to be ready, but what about this business of being alert? Readiness and alertness, they go together very well. But we need to ask ourselves the question, what is the state of our readiness. And we want to learn or we want to be reminded from this parable of the ten virgins. Virgins. We want to look at the company of the virgins, we want to look at the cry at night, and we want to look at the closed door. And so the question would be this, instead of me standing at the door and shaking hands, I would ask you the question, are you ready? what would your answer be? And if I were to ask the question, what indications can you give of your readiness? And you would look at me and say, Pastor, I'm asking the same questions of you. Readiness is the issue. 
Readiness is the issue. And we need to know how to be ready because in that readiness, there will be some sense of alertness too. The company of virgins. Then the kingdom of heaven will be comparable to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. We have before us a part of a typical Jewish wedding. It starts off with the groom going to a feast with his friends. I suppose you could call it the bachelor party. And then after that feast, they would leave for the house and the family of the bride. And then part of the vows would be said there. And then they would have another feast. And then after that, the bride and the groom with the bridal party would go to his house. And then the vows would be completed there and there would be another feast. I don't know whether they were concerned about carbs, calories, and the like. But notice that the kingdom of heaven will be comparable to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. They had a common purpose. Just as we ourselves gather here today, we are here with a common purpose. We are here to exalt Jesus Christ. We are here to renew our faith in Jesus Christ. We are here to renew our minds as followers of Jesus Christ. We have a common purpose. Their purpose was to be a part of the festivities. Their purpose was to participate in the festivities. And notice how often we can find that the return of Jesus Christ is pictured as a marriage, a time of great happiness and joy and festivity. They had a common purpose, and that common purpose gave them a common expectation as well. They were expecting the arrival of the bridegroom at any moment, and they were there expecting to meet the bridegroom. And this would be a part of the festivity. This would be a part of the joy and the happiness of the wedding. And their expectation also involved a common task. To light the way to the wedding site. To be lights. To guide that part of the wedding party to the home of the bride. To usher the groom to the wedding site. It was an honor. It was a happy occasion. It was one that they would take seriously and well. But notice the commonality. There were ten virgins. They had the common purpose. They had the common commitment, so it seemed. But notice with all of the similarity, there was a dissimilarity as well. Five of them were foolish and five were prudent. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the prudent took oil in flasks along with their lamps. There is an apparent similarity. There is indeed a common commitment up to a point. There is a common purpose up to a point. And notice there were two groups within that company. There were five who were foolish and five who were wise. And the foolish were foolish precisely because they were not fully prepared to meet the bridegroom. And that raises the question for what I've noticed in so many of the parables and what I've noticed in so much of the ministry of the Lord. Notice if we went back to those first two parables in Matthew 13, there are two kinds of unbelievers. There's the unbeliever outright, and there's the unbeliever who thinks that he is a believer. And notice that so much of our Lord's ministry was not directed to the out and out and open atheist, but to those who called themselves sons and daughters of the kingdom of God when in fact they were not. 
John in his first epistle speaks of this. James in his epistle speaks of it. They both speak of being self-deceived, thinking that they are something that they are not. There is a clarity to one who says, I do not believe in God. I do not believe in Jesus Christ. This is who I am. That's the way it is. Leave me alone. But Jesus is speaking of those who all together say that they are followers, that they are followers of him. And this is why we should take this seriously. There were these two groups. One was prepared and the other was not. They failed to bring a full supply of oil. They failed in their one task to have sufficient light to guide the bridegroom to the home of the bride. And notice there was that cry in the night. Now, while the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy and they began to sleep. Everyone was waiting for the bridegroom. All 10 of them were waiting. They were waiting, I'm sure, with eager, eager anticipation. I'm thinking that they were looking forward to when the bride and the groom were together and the vow would be taken and the festivities would begin. But the greeting party began to get drowsy and they fell asleep. But notice that they were awakened by a shout, but at midnight there was a shout. Behold the bridegroom, come out to meet him. The arrival is there. The announcement is made. The command is given. Come out to meet him, calling the virgins to go and to greet the bridegroom and to have their torches fully lit and have as bright of a light as that light could be. And notice that the shout revealed the state of readiness. Then all those virgins rose and they trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the prudent, give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the prudent answered, no, there will not be enough for us and you too. Go instead to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. It seems to me that one of the basic practical principles that we see here is this, that you cannot bring me into heaven. I cannot bring you into heaven. You may have a responsibility for my spiritual well-being, but only to a point. I may have a responsibility for your spiritual well-being, but only to a point. And that point is quite clear. Where the line is drawn, you must speak and act for yourself, and you must be responsible for yourself, and I must speak and act for myself, and I must be responsible for myself. The wise virgins were not being selfish or self-centered when they said, no, you're going to have to go get your own because there will not be enough for both of us. And if there is not enough for both of us, there will be no light whatsoever to guide the bridegroom to the home of his bride. This is serious. It revealed who was prudent and who was foolish. It revealed who was ready and who was not ready. It revealed the sense of responsibility that each one had regarding the coming of the bridegroom. How many of you have ever heard somebody speak of Christians as being some kind of a hypocrite? I think we all have heard that. And they're not going to go to church because there are hypocrites there. Well, believe me, when you see somebody polishing the boss's apple on his desk, there's hypocrisy in the office. When you see somebody shining it on in the neighborhood, there's hypocrisy in the neighborhood. And wherever there is hypocrisy, there's a statement of value. Let me ask you this question. If the dollar bill were not worth anything, would anybody take the time to counterfeit it? Wherever there is a statement of hypocrisy, there is also the presupposition of true value. And there are times when we do not live up to the standards that we should. 
But in the end, we must take responsibility for ourselves. And this is at least one of the lessons that I see here. No, there will not be enough for us and you too. Go instead to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. There are some things that we must do for ourselves. We can encourage one another, but it finally comes to the point that after the encouragement is given, we must take the action. And this is one of the important points that we see here when we speak of preparedness and readiness and being on the alert. The cry in the night exposed the distinction between the wise and the foolish virgins. But what is sad is the closed door, at least for five. The greeters heard the command, but at midnight there was a shout, Behold the bridegroom, come out to meet him. And the wise ones went out to meet him. The prudent ones were ready, and they could do their job, and they could be a part of the festivity. And you and I can do our job now and be a part of the festivity or just think that we're a part of the festivity and we will not be a part of that whatsoever. And notice that while they were going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom came and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast and the door was shut. Sometime when you have your own Bible study, study the use of the door. Notice how many times people are knocking on the door. And Jesus will say, depart from me, for I never knew you. Notice that Jesus says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man will hear my voice and open the door, I will come in with him, and I will sup with him and he with me. And it almost appears that there is a double door. That when we open the heart's door to let Jesus Christ in, he brings us into the glory of the kingdom. And the greeters heard the command, and the imprudent had to leave, and they had to go make preparation when the time of preparation was long gone, and the bridegroom and the wise, they met. And these wise virgins entered into the house, and they joined for those sacred comments, for those sacred vows, and they joined for the celebration. And then, of course, the door that important door was shut. And notice the foolish virgins. They came to that door. And later, the other virgins also came saying, Lord, Lord, open up to us. But he answered and truly said, and said, truly I say to you, I do not know you. How would you like to go? I remember, I'll tell this story, I thought it was kind of funny. There was a man that I went to seminary with. We shared several classes together. We weren't friends in the fact that we ran around together after class, but we shared any number of classes. Hadn't seen him for years. And he came to the Antelope Valley as a guest speaker. And there was a meeting held for some of the ministers in the area, and I went over to see this acquaintance. And I said, hi, I'm Don Furrow. And he blinked three times and said, who? I said, you know, Don Furrow. He blinked three more times and said, who? And I said, you know, Don Furrow. We went to Talbot together. He blinked three times and said, oh, yes. And I know that he was being polite when he said, oh, yes. How would you like to stand before Jesus Christ and say, this is who I am, this is my name, and he says, who? Say it again. Who are you? I'm sorry, I don't know you. And the door is shut. That is going to be something that's more than just comical. This is tragedy. And noticed those words, truly I say to you, I do not know you. I do not know you as a friend. I do not know you as a follower. I do not know you as a disciple. You cannot come in to the festivities. What then is our challenge on this? Notice what Jesus said. Be on the alert then, for you do not know the date nor the hour. How can you be on the alert if you don't know the day or the hour? 
when I was a youth pastor, we went up to camp one year and I had some rowdy boys in my cabin and there were some high school football players up there working at the camp all summer long to be all buffed up and ready to go for football practice. And my skinny little inner city kids went over and started, what would be the proper word? Started lipping off to them. And none of them seemed to be overly Christian at this point. And so they started calling each other out. And the football player said, we know where your cabin is. We're going to come and get you tonight. All of a sudden, I was their best friend. Mr. Furrow, they're going to come and get us. They're going to come and get us. I said, well, you're the one who asked for it. Handle it. Oh, we can't handle it. They're just big, tough football players. So I said, OK. So we went out and got a big stick, and we hooked it up. And as soon as they opened the door, that would trigger it, and the stick would come down. Now, I was hoping that I didn't have anybody really super tall, because I thought it would fly over the heads of, of them all. And I said, OK, now you guys have to be on the alert all night long. Those guys stayed up all night long, and do you think the football players came? No, they had a good night's sleep. <laughs> so I take it that we can't stay up all night waiting for the Lord to come. I take it that there has to be something else to this. We have to be on the alert because we don't know the day and we don't know the hour. And in our time, when it seems like the Church of Jesus Christ in America is taken away with prophecy and eschatology. It seems as though there's something special about knowing the day. And if they know the day, it's a lucky guess. If they know the hour, it's a lucky hour. For them, it's a lucky guess. Because the time, the moment, is held closely by the Lord himself. And for good reason. He wants us to trust in him all the time. So if we are trusting in him, the day, the time, the hour, the moment, the second, that's secondary to knowing him. And that is the important factor. Be on the alert. But how are we going to be on the alert? Take heed. Keep on the alert. For you do not know when the appointed time will come. It is like a man away on a journey, who upon leaving his house and putting his slaves in charge, assigning to each one his task, also commanded the doorkeeper to say to stay on the alert. Here is the clue. We are on the alert and we are ready when we know who we are, when we know that we are servants of the Lord, when we know that he's given us a task to perform, and when we are faithful doing that task, then we are on the alert. Then we are ready. So the question is, do you know when Jesus is coming? That's not the question at all. The question is, Am I on the alert by knowing who I am, by knowing the task that the Lord has given to me, and I am ready to do that task? I am doing that task to the best of my ability, and I will continue to do so until Jesus comes and calls me home, until he comes and I meet him and he meets me. That is when we are on the alert. That is when we are ready. Anybody can go to church. Anybody can go to Bible study. But when we go to church and we go to Bible study and when we get together for fellowship, we are doing so because we know we are called to minister to one another. We're called to encourage one another to love and good deeds. When we are called to share the gospel and the good news, not only across the seas, but in our own neighborhoods and community, it makes no difference when Jesus Christ is going to come because he's going to find us at our working posts. And so the question is, are you ready? If the answer comes back yes, and somebody says, how do you know? You can say, because I know that he is my Lord. I am his servant. He's given me a task. I know what that task is, and I'm doing it as faithfully as I can. That's what it means to confess Jesus as Lord. 
Our Heavenly Father, as we come to you in prayer, make us aware that you could come any time, any place. Give us the sufficiency of your grace that we would not be sleeping when you come. Give us the sufficiency of your grace to be standing at our post, doing whatever it is that you have called us to do, whether it's large or whether it's small. If it's the task that you have given to us, may we be faithful at the job until you come and call us to yourself and bring us into the festivities of the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's in Christ's name we pray and ask these things. Amen.